And welcome everybody to Friday Afternoon at the Manor. And my name is John Joseph Massendry. I'm the minister here. And uh, we have this series has been going since September. And each week we have a wonderful array of interesting people learning about their journey and uh, taking us from environment to books and other great, great, great events and moments in time. And today, we, it's a two-part. We have Alan Schwartz who will speak on nature and trails and walking. And, and also part two will be Mia Delia, who we'll, we'll hear a bit later. But uh, Susan Johnson uh, had an idea way back. And as a result of this, uh, this idea was born. And there's a Peter Wilkins coming in. Now, is, is that the Peter Wilkins I know uh, who's related to Anna, Anna, Anna Sarkady? I'm not sure. But... Uh, Oh, that's that's another Peter Wilkins. From okay. ESG. Okay, great. Okay. Great. Well, good to have you here. And then we have a few people. Okay, so we continue. And over to you, Susan, who will introduce our speakers. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoy what we have today. As he says, in the second half, we're going to find out about hot crust buns. Good recipe. But first of all, we've got uh, Ellen Schwartzel, who is going to let us know about all the wonderful nature available in Toronto, all our ravines and hiking trails and just places to go. You don't have to leave the city to get away from the city. So Ellen, please fill us in. Terrific. Thank you. And, uh, you know, let me know if, if you have any trouble hearing me. Um, I'm going to aim for share screen and, and maximize and, and I hope that all that good stuff works. Mm -hmm. And um, then we should be able to take it away. Um, let me see if I can maximize, which would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, here we go. How does that look to people? Can you Beautiful. see? Beautiful. Beautiful. It look good? Yes. It look good. Brilliant. Just keep letting me know if there's if there's any any issues. Um, and, and and Alan, would you like people to wait till the end to ask questions? Or are they okay to ask questions now? What's your preference? You know, I think um, I think I'm going to go through this at a fairly rapid clip. It'll be about sure. thirty minutes, and then we will have loads of time to to chat. Okay, and, thank and you. I, I really do love the chat part. So perfect. So let's so mute everyone. Everyone mute. Yeah. Good. Super. Super. Um, yeah, so so thanks so much for having me, and and uh, I'm I'm with the Toronto Field Naturalists. I'm the president of the Toronto Field Naturalists, and and I'm also a Blur uh, uh, from Blur Street United Church. So hello, neighbors, <laughs> and uh, it's great that we can get together today to talk about Toronto's ravines, which is what I really want to focus on, and I hope someday soon uh, we may be able to explore the ravines together. Meanwhile, I encourage you and your families and friends to, to discover a ravine near you. And I know that we're spread all over the city today. I heard Downsview, I heard Merton Street. So, so it's not just one locality. Um, but the ravines are definitely a place to find nature in the middle of a big city. So we know, of course, that every city has special places. Um, Toronto has the Great Thames River with many famous bridges and uh, Ottawa has the Rideau Canal, which is uh, wonderful in winter when you can skate for miles. I've done that myself. Vancouver has, of course, all that great oceanside uh, beach territory and Stanley Park as well, so that's terrific. But Toronto has ravines, and uh, we have over 11,000 hectares of, of beautiful green natural forested lands. And that's nature at our footsteps, at our doorsteps. And uh, I think today I just want to focus on the ravines, uh, although there's other great parkland as well. And we can talk about what the ravines do for us and also what we can do for the ravines. For a start, I encourage all of us to visit Toronto's ravines. Now that may seem obvious, but but in fact, not, not everybody knows that the ravines are there um, and available to us. About 60% of Toronto's ravine lands are public land, so um, uh, they're open to all. And there are over 500 kilometers of trails on, that are spread throughout the ravine network. 
and uh, about half of those are paved. So they're, they're easy to use and there's, there's signage. Um, and uh, again, as I say, we will often find ravines close to our homes. Toronto ravines are definitely for families. Mind you, they're also for joggers, they're for cyclists, they're for people who want to stroll slowly and really experience nature and for those who want to exercise and move fast. So lots and lots of people enjoy Toronto's ravines mm -hmm. and you won't be alone on the trails. So let's look a little bit at the trail system generally. Um, this gives you a big map of the area. And you'll see that Toronto's ravines are natural green valleys running through our city. Each ravine has a river or a creek flowing along the bottom, of course, and Toronto's rivers have their beginnings up north in their headwaters, so to speak, in, in the area of the, the Oak Ridges moraine. So up here um, in a landscape of forested hills and, and mingled with farmlands and wetlands. So this is the area of the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Greenbelt. And governments and community groups of all kinds have worked hard to keep this area um, protected from development. Let's look a bit more closely at Toronto's river systems. So again, um, the rivers flow from north to south into Lake Ontario, of course. And uh, what we have is we have the Humber River, in the west, the Don in the, in the middle, um, more or less uh, east of Young Street, and we have the Rouge on the east end. So those are the, the three major rivers. And the, the Humber, the Don, and the Rouge, they all flow into Lake Ontario, as I said. So our ravines form a network uh, for nature, for, for water, and for wildlife. They connect the Oak Ridges Moraine to Lake Ontario, and that's important. The ravines with their forests and meadows, they connect and protect our water. They slow the water down, they keep it cool, and they help to filter the water. Toronto's rivers begin underground, again, way up there on the Oak Ridges Moraine, and under those hills, we have a lot of gravel that was laid down or left behind by the last ice ages thousands of years ago. And that gravel holds a lot of clean groundwater. And all that groundwater is the beginning of Toronto's rivers. As the rivers flow south, of course, more and more of their watersheds are covered in buildings and pavement, roads, parking lots, sidewalks. So Toronto's watersheds are mostly paved over. And there's less and less green space to soak up the rain and to hold it. If we look around the next time we're out, we notice how much of our streets are paved over, even in residential areas. There are only patches of green space left often. And in downtown areas like here around the Royal Ontario Museum, there are really only rare patches of exposed soil in planters. All that hard pavement means that snow and rainwater runs off roads, buildings, rooftops, parking lots, sidewalks, and it goes directly into the storm sewers and from there into the creeks and rivers. It runs off really fast because there's little or no soil to soak it up and hold it and let it slow down. Like many other cities, Toronto has been seeing more flooding in recent years. And partly that is just because so much of our land has been paved over. Partly it's also a reality of a changing climate. We are getting more intense weather including heavier rainstorms. Together, the paved over land plus the changing climate means we see more flooding. Floods can happen very fast and cause a lot of damage. This flood happened on Finch Avenue in 2005. So this was one of eight extreme weather events that had happened in the previous 20 years. And uh, it was a record rainfall it caused flash flooding and washed out a portion of Finch Avenue, but also caused problems in uh, major problems in Highland Creek. There was damage to public and private property estimated between 400 and 500 million dollars. And it also flooded over 4,200 basements 
and damaged stream banks, creeks, um, uh, trees, parklands. And of course, what you see here are, are all the utilities that were, were broken. It was a, a major, major uh, event. Now, this event we may remember, this was more recently, this was July 8, 2013. And on that storm event, many rivers and creeks in Toronto area flooded and the GO train line in the Don Valley flooded. It uh, stranded 1400 GO passengers for over seven hours. And it also flooded over 4,700 basements across the city. And the cost estimates there range up into a billion dollars. So stormwater that comes off events like this or, or any sort of summer storm is not so clean. As it washes through the streets, it carries all the dirt and trash that had built up during the previous storm. Invisible pollutants like road salt are also dissolved in the stormwater. During a summer rainstorm, our stormwater also mixes with sewage because we have combined sewers in the older parts of Toronto. So what gets washed into Lake Ontario after a storm is a mix of stormwater and untreated sewage. So this is a panorama photo and it shows what Toronto Harbour looked like after one of these summer storms in 2015, when that mix of stormwater and sewage gets washed into the lake. Now, of course, we also want to keep in mind that our drinking water, Toronto's drinking water comes from Lake Ontario. It's drawn from Lake Ontario. So we have all kinds of reasons to keep our lake healthy and our water clean. So if you consider all of that, we know that Toronto's ravines have a huge job to do to help absorb, slow down, store, cool, and filter Toronto's stormwater before it flows into Lake Ontario. Without our forested ravines, we know that our flooding problems would be a lot worse. The city knows the ravines are a huge asset, but they have never yet been able to put a dollar value on the services that our ravines provide. These days though, the city managers are actually working on exactly that, on, on doing an economic benefit analysis of the ravines. So, so far what I've talked about in, in terms of the ravines is more the ravines as e essentially part of our civil engineering. They're like the ravines wearing hard hats, the tough, hard job that they do for us. And I think what I wanna talk about now are more of the, the, the soft services that the ravines provide to us that are no less important. Because we know that in Toronto, nature changes dramatically over the seasons. We know that we're just about to head, head into a, a season of, of big changes. And every month brings wonderful new developments in nature and the ravines let us enjoy all those changes up close. In spring, for example, we can find trilliums and other ephemeral spring flowers in the ravines. And of course, the, the trilliums are the official flower for Ontario. But in the fall as well, the, uh, the, the beautiful fall colors that tourists come to this part of the world to see, we can enjoy them in our backyards essentially. So the autumn is a particularly wonderful time to visit the ravines and to learn how the natural world gets ready for winter. Kids can enjoy the fall leaves too. They may want to jump into the leaves or they can make art collages with them. In winter, our ravines can be especially beautiful. Our ravines let us enjoy nature all year round and that's important because our winters are just so very long. Toronto's ravines include large forest trees, wetlands, wooded hillsides, and uh, open grasslands. So quite a range of terrain. And that means that many different kinds of birds with de many different needs can all find conditions that suit them well. Shelter, food, habitat, nesting materials, it's all there in the ravines for them. 
And as well, the ravines are safe green pathways that they can use to travel when they migrate, for example, north in the spring into northern Ontario, or if they're migrating south towards the lake, they can use the ravines as green corridors. Of course, we know, we all know people who, who love birds, maybe we're bird watchers ourselves. And for many, birds are their favorite way to connect with nature. Even in winter, some people travel thousands of kilometers to add to their bird lists, but Toronto ravines are actually a very good place to, to do birding. Over 140 species of birds are, are known to actually nest in the Toronto area. So they, they raise their families here. And a far larger number of birds um, just come through in a migratory way. So over 320 species of birds have been seen at Tommy Thompson Park, and that's uh, the Leslie Street Spit. Kids are naturally curious about birds as well. Even very small kids can get excited about birds. Birds are a great way to introduce kids to nature. Ravines provide food for birds and, and other animals at all seasons. This happens to be a choke cherry. Um, and uh, it's a bush in the rose family and uh, the berries aren't very tasty to humans, but, but robins love them, other kinds of birds love them. Later in the season, we'll find uh, dogwood berries in the ravines. And again, dogwood berries are great food for wildlife including cardinals, cedar waxwings, gross beaks, finches. So these native shrubs provide all kinds of uh, great um, food resources for, for birds and other wildlife. Some types of birds in Toronto, they stay all year round. Um, and the ravines are very, especially very important to birds that need forested habitat. The nuthatch is one example, and you can hear from the name, the nuthatch, that its, uh, its food is, is often nuts and seeds. We're all familiar with the cardinal, a wonderful bright red bird, and it lives in Toronto all year round as well, and, and often likes habitat in the ravines. Other birds raise their families much further north and only come to the Toronto area and to the ravines in the winter. Juncos would be one example. So they go north again in the spring. They just essentially, they shelter in the ravines for the winter. Now warblers are a group of birds that migrate often very, very long distances. And a large number of species of warblers come through Toronto on the, in the migratory time. And some of them come from as far away as Central or even South America. The tiny black pole warbler, for example, and it weighs only about 12 grams, it flies an annual round trip of about 20,000 kilometers from the boreal forests of North America to its winter home in the Amazon basin. Another really small bird, the Canada warbler, breeds in Ontario too, but it winters in Ecuador and Peru as far south as Lima. Canada warblers can be found in flocks high up in the Andes Mountains, but during migration, we can sometimes see them in Toronto ravines. In Toronto, spring bird migration begins in March, so right about now is when we can start looking, but uh, the best time, the, the peak time for bird migration is mid-May in Toronto. Ravines are safe places for many birds to raise families. Some species of birds, they are evolved to nest on the ground. And so for them, dogs, especially off-leash dogs, are a, are a real problem. So in Toronto, there are a few places where fences have been put up in an effort to protect ground nesting birds and, and um, give them a safe place to nest. Ravines are places where we can see wildlife close up. And it may be something as, as simple as a butterfly, this black swallowtail, for example. Or sometimes we may just see signs of wildlife and need to interpret them. This. Uh, this uh, chewed up uh, tree stump, for example, says something. Mum's the word. Okay, I'm recording again. 
And then, so l let me make you, um, Alan, share, co um, co host again. Sure. And then we go. Okay. Okay. A lot of shame. Okay. Um, so let's see if this works. Um, here we are. Um, now you let me know if you can see that. This, I think, is where we yeah. end. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's where we ended. Okay. Thank yeah. you. All Thank right. You. No worries. So, so um, yeah, maybe a beaver cut through the line somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, the point I was making really is that there are often things to see in the ravines that are not necessarily furry anim animals directly, but they're evidence. And, and that's a nice, a nice feeling too. So um, now, sometimes, you know, if we're lucky, we may see nature far away as well. Deer are obviously shy animals, but sometimes we can see them in the ravines. Now, deer incidentally love to eat trilliums, so those early spring flowers that come up early when there's not much else green, um, they get munched preferentially. So if we have too many deer in an ecosystem like the ravine system, our trilliums tend to dwindle and, and may disappear altogether. So it's one of those, you know, those interesting interactions. And obviously there are interactions uh -huh every kind. Um, and uh, we know that trees and, 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 and squirrels need each other. And, and there are so many different uh, um, mutual needs. But an interesting reality is that people need nature too. We really do need it. Toronto ravines let us enjoy nature in our everyday lives. Often we can walk from our homes to a ravine or get there by TTC. And it's really important for our mental health. Increasingly, we're seeing um, even medical doctors issuing nature prescriptions. In other words, saying, um, you know, you should get out for a walk a couple times a week. It'll do you good. Get out into nature. And many um, studies have been done and, and have been compiled showing that uh, spending time in nature can make us feel more relaxed. It, it reduces stress levels, it gives us more energy, makes us more creative and improves sleep. So all of those elements are, are really important. Ravines also connect us with the past. Our ravines are much, much older than the city itself. So this steep quarried hillside uh, in, at the brickworks, it may not look like much in the photo, but it actually offers an exciting window into the deep, deep past. In fact, this North Slope is so important that it has been named a World Heritage UNESCO site. The site was made famous by Toronto geologist A.P. Coleman, who discovered that the quarry wall showed a complete record of the past 130,000 years. It also showed that our area has been covered by glaciers, not just once, but several times. So, and, and that the climate warmed up considerably in between those two ice ages. And, and that was a um, quite a remarkable thing to discover because often a second ice age will wipe out any evidence um, that was left beforehand. And so to have a record in the geology that shows that interglacial period, that was very exciting to geologists. And this is sort of a, a, a graphic depiction of what was observed um, when, when geologists examined that, um, that quarry slope. And um, another thing that Coleman discovered at the very bottom of that, uh, in, in the bottom um, geologic layer, was the tooth of a giant beaver in the very oldest layers. So there were giant beavers living in this area, weighing about 200 pounds, about the size of a beaver, living here 130,000 years ago. Now, of course, they didn't live here all by themselves. There was a whole ecosystem. There were bison, there were giant bears. Um, and, and so it was a whole world that, that is lost now, but that we have a record for. And that we can visit virtually in, in, in downtown Toronto. 
And here is um, a, a depiction of that ancient beaver skull to give you a sense of, of the size compared to a modern beaver. Now, ravines are also important to indigenous groups. For thousands of years, these lands have been the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Indigenous peoples had a strong relationship with the land and the rivers north of Lake Ontario. They farmed many crops where the soil was good, and the soil was good in a lot of places. And they cared for trees that, that uh, provided nuts, fruit, and, and, and woods of various kinds. And walnuts were one of the types of trees that they favored and that they tended. For Indigenous nations, Local rivers also connected their trails and their trade routes. They fished rivers such as the Don River for salmon and other fish, and they hunted the marshlands around the river mouths like Ashbridge's Bay for duck, muskrat, and deer. So this was a really good land. Now we know that of course in the 1800s, European settlers began to build many lumber mills along the Humber River. Forests of white pine were mostly cut down. And today what we have on the Humber River, for example, is, is are the remnants of an old mill and the, and the old mill bridge that are reminders of that time. In the 19th century, many more mills were built along the Humber and Don, on Don Rivers. The mills used water power to saw logs, make paper, grind grain. And so the ravines became major industrial areas. In fact, um, the, a very large brick factory and a quarry were built in the Don Valley because really good clay was found right there. And at one time, the Don Valley brickworks supplied most of the bricks for the buildings in Toronto. At one point, about 100 years ago, this was the largest brick factory on the continent. Many men worked there. The brickworks finally closed in the 1980s and they left behind the factory buildings, extensive areas of rubble and a huge deep hole. Meanwhile, on another uh, valley in the Don Valley, Sun Valley, a garbage dump was established in the 1950s and through the 1960s, it received hundreds of truckloads of garbage a day. In some spots, the garbage was 25 meters deep. So there were a lot of sites on our ravines that, that were treated that way. Back to that large hole in, at the old brickworks, a few people ha had a vision that really this site should be restored. And Evergreen formed a partnership with the city, with the Toronto Region Conservation Authority and with philanthropists too. And the quarry hole was filled in over time. Um, among other things, the uh, Scotia Plaza excavation, which uh, produced an enormous amount of uh, underground excavate, was used to fill in this quarry. And uh, as a result of that vision and, and all that hard work and collaboration, the brickworks have been cleaned up and they are now really beautiful again, restored to nature, there are snapping turtles in these wetlands and beavers. So we really are the beneficiaries of, of that vision. Toronto ravines still need a lot of help though. The city continues to grow really quickly and projects like roads, sewers and public transit often run right through the ravines because that is the that is the root of, of um, least uh, resistance, you could say, people don't live there. And uh, here's just one current example. In East Toronto, Metrolinx is expanding rail service for commuters. And of course, that's an important and, and laudable goal. The challenge is though, that in order to produce a retaining wall, hundreds of trees in this ravine will be, will be cut down. And people who live nearby want to save those trees. They've put ribbons around them in order to depict how much uh, damage will be caused by this, by this uh, construction. And um, the, the neighbors are asking for a construction plan that doesn't destroy so much of the ravine. 
But this is really just one example in a city our size, there are, there are challenges for the ravine system almost everywhere you look in terms of infrastructure, uh, building and, and, and maintenance. Another challenge that we find across the ravine system is erosion because the ravines are in many places used so well and, and they are quite steep, the paths just become eroded. The, the plants can't grow there anymore. The eroded bare dirt washes down the hillsides and the tree's roots become exposed. And uh, so the trees begin to fail and it, it becomes a, a, vi a vicious cycle. So eroded paths are a problem in, right across the city. Litter is another perennial problem in our ravines. Plastic, we know, sticks around for a very, very long time, even though it may break down into little bits. And so tiny bits of plastic are now everywhere in our rivers and lakes. As well, we have new types of weedy plants that have been introduced from Europe and Asia and they can quickly take over vast areas of ravine land because the native insects and the native wildlife just prefer to eat something else. And so Toronto has many kinds of invasive weeds, um, whether it's um, buckthorn or, or European common reed or um, uh, Japanese knotweed. So garlic mustard is just one example, unfortunately. Dogs, the city has a lot of dogs. And dogs running off their leashes, they will scare birds, as I mentioned, and, and other wildlife. But they can also, just by running through the undergrowth, they can uh, spread the seeds of, of those invasive uh, weeds in their paws and in their fur. And so that contributes to the weeds being spread even faster. Toronto has at least 230,000 dogs. And with the pandemic, for example, we know that many people have, have um, bought pandemic puppies, so to speak. And um, of course, people need pets. They're important companions, but it's more the way that the dogs are exercised and, and allowed to roam free in the ravines that is the challenge. Toronto uses a lot of road salt in the winter, and that's terrible for trees and for other plants. So salt is also bad for fish, frogs, and all the aquatic insects that have their larval stages in the uh, creeks and rivers. And we know that um, the, the, the tonnages of, of road salt that the city uses are just stupendous. So all in all, the people who have studied ravines have been telling city managers for quite some time about all these problems and, and the neglect and, and the challenges. And uh, the message was clear that the ravines need help. And the weeds that, uh, that invaded the ravines, they were a sign that the city had to act. So to address all that, that public concern, city managers wrote a strategy and they promised that things would change. Of course, money is going to be needed to, to bring the ravines back to health. And so money has been promised and, and um, there's hope that it will really start flowing. And we can all get involved to help to speak to our councillors about that and also to, to um, be volunteers where we see the value for that. Where we can start really is by getting to know our ravines, especially the ones near where we live. And often the easiest way to do that is to go to the City of Toronto website and search for walking, cycling, hiking. And what you'll find there is descriptions of some of the more popular trails and where they start. And you'll also see maps of the city, um, the east and the west. And uh, this is an area that's um, around Manor Road United and, and the, the Happy Face is sort of roughly where uh, the church is. So you get a sense of, of the, all those brown lines are the ravine uh, trails that are close by but the whole city has them. Another good way to discover the ravines is to come on a guided walk with the Toronto field naturalists. In normal years, the Toronto field naturalists runs over 140 guided walks all over Toronto's ravine system. Our walks are free to our members and, uh, and visitors can come too. 
And uh, we have walks in winter months as well. We run them all through the season. During the pandemic, of course, we had to shut down our walks and, um, and they're, they're shut at this time. But once public health rules allow, we will go back to leading small groups, about 10 or less, and everyone will be wearing masks. So do check our website to find out when our walks begin again, because we can't say for sure when that will be. Um, our volunteer guides are, can tell you all about the, the plants and the animals and the history of the ravines. And we can tell you about the odd plants like Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, that you'll see in the spring in, in, in some areas. And we'll also help to make you alert to areas, patches of poison ivy and, and um, keep you out of those areas. Our volunteers also work with the city and other groups to control invasive weeds. And here you see the European common weed in the background. It's a particularly difficult one to, um, to control. It needs specialized help. And so we don't do this in isolation. We do this uh, very much in partnership with city staff. Our members also help clean up garbage in the ravines. And of course, there's many, probably um, close to 100 different volunteer groups who help to maintain garbage control in the ravines. And our volunteers also work with the city to plant native trees and, and other plants. We offer native. Uh, we offer uh, programs for for kids as well. Kids are very important to us, and so we've always run a junior naturalist program. And in fact, uh, um, Robert Bateman, who is one of Canada's best known artists, wildlife artists, he was in his youth a um, a student with uh, with the junior naturalists of TFN, and later became an instructor. and And he felt that it helped. To, to form him and his passion. And so we never know who might be coming through as a kid and, and, and will become a um, passionate lover of nature as they grow up. TFN has been around for almost 100 years now, and we've always seen our mission as connecting people with nature in the Toronto area. Today, the work of the Toronto Field Naturalists is, is more important than ever, and we are all still just volunteers. We have no staff. And you can find more about us at our website, as I said, and um, there's our website. And uh, do consider becoming a member, uh, especially at this time of year, where you, um, you get almost 15 months worth of membership if you join around this time of year. So it's a bargain as well as being a, a really good investment in nature. In the meantime, if you explore Toronto's ravines on your own, just keep in mind that you wanna stay on the trails and, and take your litter out and keep your dog on a leash. and, and those are, that will go a long way to, to um, being gentle on our ravine systems. So we really do hope that our volunteer walk leaders will soon be able to show you some of Toronto's wonderful ravines. And, and so now I'm, I'm happy to, to chat and, and take questions and, and comments and observations. This is often where I learn most of all is, is in the conversation with others. So these are all, these have all been, um, uh, volunteer photographers who contributed here. And so we have a lot of photographers who help us. So thanks very much. And I'm going to stop sharing at this point and then well, we can... Well, thank you, Alan. If people want to turn on their videos and what we can do, we can um, ask questions, but probably we can, the easiest thing to do, we'll put, put up hands and we'll try to do our best. And I see Debbie has her hand up and we'll try to keep track of those uh, hands. And so, and then one second, Debbie, well, well, we start with Debbie and then Peter. Okay. Are you looking for volunteers for your organization? Cause I'm up in Black Creek, um, Grand Ravine. I go down there every day. I have a, um, sanctuary down there and it's just, I'll tell you at this time of the year, when I whistle for the cats, the word, the birds whistle back. It's yeah. so divine. It's just beautiful and since the pandemic hit 
it's been absolutely wonderful because I've been living here for almost 14 years and I've finally see people walking down in this ravine. They have to get over the issue of Jane and Finch, but it's just absolutely beautiful down there. Um, What's the the word on that, Ellen, for for Debbie? um, We we definitely, now, of course, at the moment, the challenge is that um, our, our volunteers, just like everybody else, we have to be really super careful. So we're not using volunteers at the moment. Um, not not hands-on volunteers. We we don't have any sort of cleanups that are planned for the moment for April. But w- you know, we just have to wait until everybody's or until enough people are vaccinated. Okay. And- so what I meant, okay, I guess by a volunteer is, um, well, I talk to people when I'm down there. I take them on little walks. You know what I mean? We're of course socially distanced. And I'm I'm able to point out different areas in the ravine where they should go see. Um, May I may I share my screen for a second? Um, We'll we'll give you one one sharing because we have a a lot of other people have questions. So okay, okay, sure, okay. And we have Anne too. Okay, one second. We have Peter then Anne. Okay. I've only got about two minutes because I have to run. I am at work. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. That was very, very interesting. Um, I've had the pleasure of exploring the Don Valley for years and years and years and years. I lived there. I played in behind the brickworks as a child and and ran up and down all the all the ravine hills. What I find so wonderful about this city is I just uh, a few years ago moved to Etobicoke. And so now I have a whole new wonderful place to explore with the Etobicoke Creek system and the Humber River system. And it's just really amazing. And I'm really glad that there is a Toronto naturist or natural, what is it, the Toronto field naturalists, naturalists. Yeah. Um, wonderful that uh, that there is this group that's kind of looking after these wonderful places that are often hidden gems there's a lot of people who don't even know how wonderful the um, ravine systems are and and um, there's a there's a, a group of us actually um, that I met through golfing out east of the city and we've been doing similar things, exploring all the places like Petticoat Creek and the Rouge Valley and um, all the uh, wonderful places just east of, of Toronto. So there just is so much to explore. I don't know if I'm ever going to get through all of the reviews. <laughs> yes, but thank you. It's always so unpredictable. It's the serendipity of it. Because when you have a dozen people who go out together, Um, you never know who's got the expertise or who's got the sharpest eyes and, um, and everybody learns from everybody. So, you know, I, I think that that's, that's really the the joy of it often is that, um, I mean, I feel myself, I'm a lifelong beginner, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a good bird or I'm really, you know, I'm just blown away, but by whatever it is I discover that day. And that's what happens on these real life walks. And that's also, I'm also a mushroom hunter, and it's amazing how much edible mushrooms there are in, in these ravine systems. There's a lot of them. They're really good. Okay, so we, we want to allow for more questions. To Peter, you had a question too. Um, I had to step away, so hopefully you haven't covered this while I was gone. Can you talk about the number of creeks that are covered over in the ravine system, why they are? Is there any plan, plans to uncover them right well there's a whole group that in fact many years ago was in a way uh spawned by the toronto field naturalists called uh, lost rivers and i encourage you to check them out i have have seen that yes yeah because in a way we partner often we we share group walks and so forth so we have a long history of, of working together and they um, they feature that reality that um, Garrison Creek, Tattle Creek, 
Um, oh, there's so many of there's them. Yellow Creek, Mud Yellow Creek, Creek. Yes, in my area. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, I think that they were often buried, well, be, because the civil engineers of the time thought that that would be for the best, you know, that they were, they were smelly, they had become smelly open sewers. And of course, there's this long standing history that um, in urban, older urban centers, uh, before we had sewage treatment plants, um, you really did have sewage going, you know, through the creek. So it was, you know, keep your kids away from them. And, um, and, and it's, I think it's very hard to undo that. That's, I, it's, it's a challenge for sure. But, but it, it's a, it's something for us to keep in mind that um, it was a mistake and we don't, don't want to repeat it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? So, Gary. Uh, I live on Lawrence <laughs> Avenue East in Scarborough and our property abuts Thompson Park. And occasionally we see the deer I was wondering, do you have any idea what the deer population is in the ravines in Toronto? No, I don't. It's a great question, but I think it's healthy. Um, and and it, it and and you know, I think that they um, they find that. I would be surprised, really, whether there there are many coyotes that could take down a, an adult deer. They could t they could con. Um, handle the fawns, of course, and I suppose mm -hmm. that's how their population is, is kept in check. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so I know that in other places in Southern Ontario, uh, for lack of um, real predator control, deer populations have really almost become overwhelming. And um, so, you know, we're, we're no longer in a wilderness, so we do have to manage everything. And I, you know, I don't think we're going to be seeing hunting in the city. But. Okay, so what are we doing about the coyotes? I mean, well, we're, okay, we're, I, I know they've taken down three deer because I've seen the carcasses mm -hmm. and they weren't fawns. They were actual deers. Mm. And um, do you think they could start eating the raccoons? Wouldn't that be nice? I think you're way too smart. <laughs> no, I, I, I well, I, I'm joking, of course, but, but you know, raccoons are super smart. And, but, no. and, and the funny thing is that there is a, uh, there's someone who has done extensive um, uh, tracking of ra uh, raccoon populations around parks like uh High Park, for example, to see, you know, where do these raccoons live? Well, it turns out that the, the density is much, much higher in um, people's backyards and uh, in around people's homes, because of course, that's where the garbage is. That's where the food is. And so why would they live in a park? Like there's not a nearly enough food for them. <laughs> well, no, except for when you feed the cats, the raccoons come every night. And yes. I have to make sure the cats come down, you know, while I'm there so that they at least get some of the food. But they, the raccoons keep taking the dishes. You know what I mean? And it's like last year they brought the dishes back. So I'm waiting for them to see if they'll bring them back again this year. <laughs> I mean, like, aren't, it's aren't craziness. They, aren't they polite? Do we have any other questions from people? No. Well, I would say Ellen has been remarkable. And, you know, it's definitely we have a thousand questions. I wanted to ask, what was the temperatures between the interglacial period? Maybe that we have time for that one question. Uh, well, it was warmer than it is today. Okay. It, it okay. Warmer than it is now. So it got quite warm and, and there were, um, you know, there were things that you would see quite a bit south of us, uh, right. tree species and so on. And um, so, so that's a, you know, that's a fascinating thing to, to keep in mind is that our, our climate does fluctuate over long periods of time. So, so I do just want to say that I'm, I'm happy to give this talk um, in other venues. So if you know of ratepayers groups or other, you know, other groups across the city, I'm, I'm happy to reach out to them. And, and uh, you know, we want, we want the Toronto Field Naturalists to be um, 
open and available to people right across the city. In, in the Black Creek area, for example, definitely, um, there are lots of communities that live quite close to the ravines. And uh, as you say, Debbie, they, they aren't familiar with them. They're, they're worried that they're uh, a little bit, you know, scary place. And, and that's a shame because they really should be there for everybody. So Ellen, you yeah, now have I about- keep encouraging people to go down there because yeah. it's just beautiful. So Ellen, you now have another 14 disciples to call, uh, but we'll spread the word. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the name of your organization is Toronto Naturalists? Toronto Field Naturalists. Field. Okay. I'll look you up. Thank yeah. you, Ellen. It's been okay. remarkable. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Very thank good. you Ellen. So, so don't One leave, everybody. We have now part two. And uh, part two, just to take, take a stretch, sit up and down and stretch a bit. And we have over to uh, now... <laughs> Do you want to introduce our next uh, next speaker who is actually going to cook and make, make tempt us with other things? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Our next guest is Chef Mia de Alla. She's the executive pastry chef at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. So she is going to tell us about hot cross buns, how to make them, all you need to know. So Mia. Okay. M M Mia, you may want to change your, the orientation of your screen. You, you, it looks like you're standing on the side of, the, of a building. but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there, there's a way to do that in the Zoom room. Yo, know, there we go. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I'm just gonna highlight you too. I'll put you on spotlight so we can see a bit better. That's good. Okay, all right. There's Mia. Okay, good. And you got to unmute. There we go. Okay. Yeah, Mia. Mia is, oh, and I was gonna show uh, before I forget. I was gonna show the YouTube uh, about the history of hot grass buns. So bear with me as I line that up. And here we go. One second. There it is. I want to give it people yeah, oh, one second. There, okay. And there we are. Share screen. Just reminded me, okay. So hot cross buns have been around us for a couple of centuries, but here's a bit of history from YouTube. Buns. This is an original Victorian recipe, although we can date hot cross bun recipes right back to the medieval period. Now, of course, we know hot cross buns are made around Easter, along with things like Simnel cake. There are a lot of traditional food associated with festivals, but the one we most associate with Easter is probably hot cross buns. Now, hot cross buns have had many different recipes over the years, but they've always been very popular. The reason we actually made hot cross buns is to eat for breakfast on Good Friday. And actually, the name of them, first of all, was Good Friday Buns, or Cross Buns. They got the name Hot Cross Buns by the ladies who were selling them in the streets, using it as a little bit of a gimmick to sell them, crying Hot Cross Buns, sort of fresh out of the oven, trying to sell them to all of the people around them. And actually, that's where we get the rhyme from, too. You see, you might know the rhyme, one a penny, two a penny, Hot Cross Buns. That's because the ladies that were selling them in the street would sell one large hot cross bun for one penny or two small hot cross buns for one penny. Now, the most characteristic thing about hot cross buns is the cross on the top. Now, you might know it as having a white cross on the top of it, which is formed by white strips of pastry being laid across the top of the bun. But actually, most hot cross buns throughout history have been made with carving a groove into the top of the dough in the shape of a cross. And there was a reason for this. You see, right back to the medieval times, we know that they thought by putting a cross on the top of the bun, they would ward away all of the evil spirits that could take hold of the dough and make it go moldy faster. So by putting a cross on the top, they were protecting their food, keeping it for longer. And actually it became known as a bit of a good luck charm in the kitchen. Some people even hung them around the side of the kitchen to keep their kitchen running well. So hot cross buns have really varied history to them. And of course, they're still very popular today. So what I've got here is the dough already made. I'll split it into smaller pieces to make the actual individual hot cross buns and put the cross in it before it goes in the oven. But what I thought I'd do now is actually run through the ingredients that we've used. And the ingredients... There we go. That just gives a, a bit of history. Uh, Mia's going to do the cooking, but it tells you a bit of the background, which I think is 
always good to sort of know, know, know the framing and story. So over to you, Mia. Hi. Um, so I want to start with the, the ingredients first. Um, the first part of it is to, uh, you want to hydrate your yeast and we're using a dry yeast because that's what's readily available to everyone. Um, when you're hydrating a yeast, the yeast is actually um, dead yeast on the outside and live yeast on the inside. When you hydrate it, you're, you're taking the dead yeast to allow the live yeast to come up and do its work. Um, you want to always warm uh, your liquid that you're going to hydrate your yeast with because the, the warmth promotes the, the yeast to be active. It likes to be in a good environment. Um, the other thing we're adding to the, the milk and the water is the sugar and the sugar feeds the yeast to get very active. It's just like when you uh, have sugar, you want to go run and go crazy because you have so much energy in you. So you want to put the sugar and the yeast inside uh, your liquid. And then you want to let this sit for about 20 minutes to get it to hydrate and let, let it start doing its thing. Uh, once it has been hydrated, uh, it looks like this. It's really foamy on the top and the water's on the bottom. Okay. Um, then we're going to take all our ingredients. So this is the water, the milk, and the yeast. And we have um, whole, whole wheat flour and a regular hard or bread flour. Uh, the bread flour itself gives you a lot of gluten to help the structure uh, hold better. But the yeast, because it's low gluten, it kind of gives you a softer texture to your uh, bread. So we're going to start off with those. And we want to mix that with our uh, dough hook. Uh, usually the first minute and a half is allowing your uh, dry ingredients, which is your flowers, to hydrate. Um, when water touches the flour, the starches in the flour start developing the gluten in the flour itself. So it's starting the, the process of developing the structure for your bread. So we're going to put this on our mixer and we're going to do about uh, a minute and a half. So you don't want to, so, that's, so the next ingredient that we're going to add to it is salt. Uh, salt is, is added for flavor in anything that you're making, baking or cooking. Um, the thing with uh, yeasted products is that the salt actually hinders the action of the yeast. So you have, to, I like to put it in about after a minute and a half so that the yeasts are, are nicely established and they're doing their job already. Once you add salt, it starts slowing the process down. So you wanna do this as it's, um, after it started getting uh, active. You wanna make sure that your, your dough is getting hydrated well. So if it's not picking up because your dough is, um, is very uh, dry, you can see my dough. Um, you want to make sure that you push all of the ingredients so that they're getting hydrated properly and then you're going to continue to mix. I got two eggs, sorry, that's why it's there. There's two eggs also in there. Sorry, I got, I got excited with the walks because I love the ravines and uh, the ravine talk. So interesting. Right. Once you add the egg, it'll start to absorb more liquid. And once the flour is more hydrated, you can increase the speed. So now it's hydrated, I'm going to add my salt. And I'm going to increase the speed. And now I want to, 
I want to develop the gluten. So I'm going to let this run for at least about five minutes before I stop. And for me, I want to check the development by um, pulling the dough and stretching it to see how the gluten is developed. So the next ingredient we're gonna add is the butter. But as the as like salt, uh, adding a fat to yeast slows them down. It's like when you have a heavy meal, you don't wanna go running, you just wanna sit and do nothing, right? So it's the same thing. Um, a yeast is a, a microorganism, and basically, if you if it's still something that needs food, it still acts like a, a actual being where it's fed, it needs uh, nourishment, and it grows as it 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 in a good environment. I'm gonna increase the speed now. It'll catch a bit better. Get the bowl down again. So this is also the point where you're going to check and see if you need to add more flour or if you need to add a bit more uh, water. Um, and if it's too dry, then you're going to add a, a little bit more water, but if it's too wet, you're going to just add a little bit of flour to help bind it together to create your dough. And you're actually trying to get it to clean up stage. So clean up stage is when the dough starts coming away from the bowl. and uh, cleaning up the bottom of the bowl. So now you're just gonna check um, after about two or three minutes to see how the gluten is developing in your dough. So one of the things that, that shows you how to uh, check the development of your dough is pulling the dough to the point where it holds its shape still as you pull it, uh, but also um, you can see through it when you pull it. So I'm going to take a piece of the dough. Okay. And if I pull the dough and I can pull it enough without it breaking, then I know I can add my fat. And this is called a window test, a window pane test. So it's breaking right now. So we're gonna mix it a little bit longer. But as it, if it um, holds its shape enough, like see how it's, I just folded it once. That means it just needs to build probably 30 seconds. But see how you can see through this membrane of the dough? That's how you know it's almost done. So I'm gonna do another half a minute, two minutes. The 
thing with your butter, it should be at room temperature um, so that it can emulsify into your dough well. And if you can see, I'm gonna pull it and it's not tearing. You can see through the through it without it tearing. So we're gonna start adding our butter now. And um, butter now, it's really strange. They've, um, they've actually started to begin to add uh, palm oil to butter. So then when it's at room temperature, this, this butter has been outside since yesterday. It, I can't even, I can't even um, it's not soft anymore. So the fat content in butter now has changed because of what they've been feeding their um, the the cows and the cows um, milk now has a higher fat content. So the the fat is more stable when it's at room temperature. Every once in a while, you are going to um, try and get the, the fat that you want to incorporate into your dough. So you're going to have to uh, always scrape down the sides of the bowl to make sure that it's getting in the dough and not just sticking to the walls of the bowl. Once your dough, you can't see the, the fat anymore and the dough is very uniform uh, in texture, is the time that you're gonna add your uh, candied fruits. And our candied fruits today are sultanas, uh, raisins, candied ginger, and apricots. Um, and then we also have candied orange zest. I'm gonna add that in. So this is, at this point, you're just trying to incorporate all your inclusions into the dough so that the dough holds the inclusion. Once your dough has taken all the inclusion, you're gonna take, you're gonna turn out your dough and you're gonna round it up and let it sit and ferment for about 45 minutes, okay? my dough. When you turn out your dough, you want to lightly dust the table. You never want to add too much um, flour to your dough. The more flour you add to your dough when you are rolling or processing your dough will toughen your dough. So you want to be very minimal when you are dusting the table. And usually, um, if I don't want to put it on any more flour, I will actually wet my hands so that I can I can handle the dough without it sticking. Okay. And then what you're trying to do now is to create a skin to capture all of the uh, CO2 that the yeast is going to make. And basically you're just turning the dough on under itself so that the uh, outer layer is nice and tight and creating a skin. So it's nice and smooth. Once you have a nice smooth skin, you're gonna place it in a greased bowl and you're gonna let it sit for 45 minutes, okay? After 40 mi 45 minutes or at the point where the dough has doubled, um, you're gonna take your dough and you're gonna divide your dough into um, 80, 80 gram pieces. So I have another dough here and you can see how it, this one's a double batch, but it's like tripled in size. Uh, it's, it's been sitting longer than I was hoping for, but it's okay. Um, and basically you wanna dump your dough onto your table and you wanna deflate the dough uh, from all the large uh, air pockets that's developed because you don't want to have huge air pockets in your um, in your cross buns. So we're going to lightly dust the top 
And now we're gonna divide the pieces into um, 80 gram pieces. Uh, I'm gonna put them in a pan, this pan for now, and I'm just gonna do six for you. So you're gonna divide it. I usually take strips first. And once I get the strip, I'm gonna cut my 80 gram pieces. And you usually, uh, when you're making any doughs like this, there's always resting time because every time you um, work the dough, you're forming gluten. And the, the more gluten you develop, the, the more uh, dense and uh, tough it gets. So you always wanna let it rest so that you can have this elasticity to be able to pull your dough and work your dough nicely without overworking it, okay? So that's so now you want to um, you basically want to now uh, form your dough. So you're going to take you want to let these rest for at least 10 minutes. And after your 10 minutes, you're going to take your dough and you're going to turn it over and basically take the edges and fold them in. OK, you're now creating another tighter skin in these smaller balls so that the smaller ones um, have the same uh, tension on the surface of your ball. Um, and usually we like to round it up on the, on the table just to tighten it. And it's, it's kind of hard to explain to you, but you basically, if you, if you don't know how to do the rounding with your single hand, um, it's actually just pulling your dough towards you without too much flour. And what you're doing is Every time I pull it, I'm actually sealing the bottom so that it, it actually has a very tight seal. And then when I get a smooth surface, I'm gonna pinch this to close it so that it's still holding all this, the, the CO2 that the yeast is producing. And then we wanna give them at least a good enough space in your, in your container. And then after um, you've rounded this up, you want to cover it with um, either a tea towel or you can put parch uh, saran wrap on it and then the saran wrap will help protect it from getting a skin. And then you want to rest it again for about another, at least another um, 45 minutes or uh, as long as it's double in size, okay? So once it's doubled in size, which are these ones here, you can see how they, they've uh, expanded quite a bit. Um, you're going to take uh, egg wash, which is, just one egg, one egg yolk, uh, a teaspoon of milk and a pinch of salt. And you want to give them a first layer of egg wash. Okay, once you do that, uh, you'll go back and do a second layer so that you get a really nice caramelization on the top of the hot cross bun. And I know um, you're a lot of people do the cross with the with the paste, but I don't like the paste. I usually let these uh, bake and get the nice roundness and an even color all the way through. And once it's completed, um, I actually put a um, a royal icing on the uh, on the top that's been flavored with uh, cinnamon and cardamom because when you put cinnamon into um, the bread itself. It's an it's a, a antifungal um, ingredient, so it actually may kill your yeast, and then it will not uh, puff up, and uh, you'll get dense um, hot cross buns. And I don't want that at all. So I'd rather have that flavor in my icing versus it being in my dough, um, so that I know that my dough will uh, prove really well. And most people who, who are bakers 
would prefer not to put cinnamon and cardamom inside your dough. Uh, it's usually when you roll it out and you sprinkle it inside the dough or on the outside of dough. It's never usually inside for the fear that it will kill your yeast and then the yeast won't do its job. Um, I have my oven at 350. Uh, I've preheated it and it usually, so we've been baking it um, 15 minutes and then we turn it and then uh, another eight to 12 minutes until you get an internal temperature of 190 degrees Fahrenheit or 90 degrees Celsius. So to get that reading, you always wanna have a instant read thermometer. So you're gonna pop these in the oven. I have a, and I bought a really cheap kind of instant read thermometer from Walmart. Uh, this was about $12.99, but this ensures me that when I'm baking my breads, that if I get that read inside the bread, that the bread is always cooked. Um, so you, you wanna bake it for now, I'm gonna put it for 15. Uh, once it's baked, um, then we're gonna do two things to it. So you're gonna wanna make a simple syrup first. And my simple syrup is just usually uh, one, one part by weight of water and uh, one part of sugar. So if you're gonna make, um, 100 grams of water, you're gonna put 100 grams of sugar. You wanna bring that to a boil and then you'll get a uh, simple syrup like this. It's quite thick, but uh, one of the secrets that uh, French chefs uh, actually do as uh, their pastries come out of the oven, they will brush this liquid on their, um, on their end product to give it a beautiful shine. The second thing we're gonna do is create a royal icing. So uh, this royal icing um, is just basically 250 grams of icing, a gram of cardamom, a gram of uh, cinnamon, and um, 40 grams of a liquid. So it could be milk, it could be water, it could be orange juice. Um, as long as you have the 40 grams of water to liquefy it, then you're going to have a nice fluidity to do your proper piping. When the hot buns come out, so I'll show you them here, um, they are very uh, nice and hot, but you want to make sure that once they come out of the oven, you're gonna take your syrup and you're gonna brush them to give them not only a shine, but also uh, a dousing of liquid to help the moisture inside. After you've put the syrup, you wanna let it dry out so that you can actually put the icing. So this is one that's been sitting for a while. And you're gonna take your icing right here, and you're gonna put it in a piping bag, and then you're gonna ice the, the buns with a cross. So usually you just wanna do, I always go all the way across to as many as I can do. And then before you serve, you wanna just let them harden so that uh, that cross stays on it. Okay. So once they're nice and hardened, um, you have these. And these are your finished hot cross buns. Um, so if you have any questions for me, I would take questions right now if you'd like. Beautiful. I'll just remove the spotlight so we can see people. And do people want to, do you have any questions of Mia? And uh, we can send that recipe to people. And boy, that yeah. made, made it all look so easy. Jen, over to you. What question do you have? <laughs> yeah, Mia used um, uh, a dough hook. Yep. And how, how long would that take if you didn't have a dough hook? So if you're going to do a pie thin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually it takes about 20 minutes to get 20, uh, the gluten developed uh, to the point where you can pull it and see through it. And would you knead it like you would bread? Without yep. Just, yep. Yeah. It would just be it would just be taking the, the bread the dough itself and just giving a knead like this 
until you get the gluten developed. So you're just pulling and pressing it into the dough until it comes together. And when you take the dough and you can pull it like this, see how I'm being able to pull it to get it thin? This is the way you're gonna test it to make sure that you can see through it without right. it breaking. Okay, okay. So about 20 minutes, Seth. Uh, Roughly 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's a good workout after. <laughs> Very Thank fancy. you. Any other questions? Judy. Well, it seems like a lot of work, and uh, I give you a lot of credit for doing that. That's amazing. You should Thank see you how so many much. we made today. We made so many today. We did I'd like, like to live near buses. you. <laughs> oh, I'd like to live near you and come again. <laughs> if, you know, you if you know John Joseph, then anytime we have, for sure. <laughs> So, so Judy, Judy, we're, we're delivering to those who want some. Do you want some? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll put you on the list. Okay. You're, you're, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. They're beautifully soft and really fluffy buns. So I, I, I just think that you should give them a chance because I don't know if you've got had really good, um, fresh hot cross buns. Hot cross cross buns that are made on the same day are really fantastic. They're to die for, yes. I see. Yeah. Peter, Peter McDonald has a question. Then Gary. Peter. No, I just Peter? want to say I wanted some fun hot cross buns, please. I'll add, <laughs> I'll add to the list, Peter. Okay, great. Okay. I, th I thought I thought you would I added your name to the list. Okay, uh, Peter. Okay, so Peter McDonald, and then uh, Gary. We have a question. You're you're muted, Gary. Gary, you're muted. Are you still muted? Okay. Here we go. You mean you're not reading lips today? Okay, good. Uh, no, I was, uh, you did answer my question. You said they were fluffy and tasty. Oh, yeah. She always has that comment. I'm going to taste it for you. And she tells <laughs> how wonderful all her food is. And I'm sure yours is as well. I liked your presentation. Yeah, Thank you. Very good. Very good. Fabulous, fabulous. Very tempting, very tempting. Now, any other questions from people? No, Where well. can we get the recipe? Uh, so I think, now Mia, you sent me a recipe and then we're going to send it to people, right? Yeah, I'm going to uh, revise it because we didn't add the icing on it. So I'm going to, I have it in my computer and I'll send you the one with the icing so you can use the icing too, for sure. So Debbie, I have your email, so I'll send it to you too, okay? That'd okay, perfect. Very Thank good. You. It was an interesting fact about cardamom, no, cinnamon being an antifungal. I didn't know yeah. that. So it's a preservative, an ancient preservative. Yeah, uh, it's, 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 but it kills the yeast, right? It's right, not, of course, yeah. It's yeah, but, awful. Uh, People don't want to put it in. And, and you'll see if you made a, if you've never made a dough and you, you're like, oh, I want to have it really cinnamony, the dough won't rise and you'll get really dense product and it doesn't it's just hard so that's maybe one of the reasons why if you've ever made anything with cinnamon and yeast um you got a, a dense product it's usually the, the the cinnamon killed the yeast right but you remind me some middle eastern cultures and other cultures use cinnamon on their meat yes <laughs> as, as, as the savory and so that that would be a natural then why they would do that wow oh, what a learning moment i love that <laughs> okay well well thank you everyone and and Susan, do you want to bid us a farewell and tell us who we have for next week? I don't have my notes for next week, but... Okay, um, we, we actually have um, one second. I just had it in front of me. Uh, there we are. It's... Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, Jenny Blackbird. Oh, wonderful, yes. She's an amazing person, and certainly I really suggest you show up. She's just a wonderful person. She's... Um, been at Manor Road for some of our celebrations. And I hope you enjoyed the talk today and follow up and join us next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. This was amazing.